signature weapon of the wars we're in, the signature weapon used against U.S. troops in Iraq and in recent years also in Afghanistan, is the IED, the improvised explosive device, the homemade bomb. Because of that, American troops' signature wound from these wars is traumatic brain injury, traumatic brain injury and or post-traumatic stress, both of which are relatively hard to diagnose and hard to treat. Three years ago, the intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund opened a state-of-the-art rehab center in Texas, a privately funded super high-tech center to rehabilitate vets who lost arms or legs in combat. Today, the same fund opened another state-of-the-art, privately funded, super high-tech center, this time to rehab vets with TBI, with traumatic brain injury and with post-traumatic stress. It's a huge 72,000 square foot facility. There's nothing like it in the world. It's on the campus of the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda. But again, it's a privately funded thing. They call it NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence. The Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen, had both been scheduled to attend today's opening ceremony in Bethesda. But some stuff came up this week in military matters. You might have heard about that. So they canceled. Um, and instead of being at the opening ceremony in Bethesda, Secretary Gates and Admiral Mullen were where you see them here at the Pentagon, giving a rare two honcho in person press briefing on the implications of the firing of the top commander in Afghanistan. Now, under the circumstances, it doesn't seem terribly unreasonable that anyone in the upper echelons of the military and the war effort right now has seen their schedules upended by this week's quite unforeseen events. But check out the angle angry response at the opening of the Center for Wounded Vets, this response to the fact that there weren't recognizable high-ranking officials there today. Last night, I thought about this event and about this building. You, young men and women who risk your life, risk your life every day for us, and I thought about the way we care for them. And I got angry. I was angry because here we are in the nation's capital, the seat of our government, the very people who decide your fate, the people who send you out to protect our freedoms, and yet, where are they? Not one senator, or two, only two congressmen, no one from the White House at all, no cabinet members, where are they? And why we appreciate that much. And why we appreciate that much of our military leadership that is present, our government should, behind, should be behind this effort. I know these are difficult times. I read newspapers, I see the news, and still, where are they? They call you out. You are injured. We are all here. Where are they? I know where they are. They're in Washington dealing with the fact that the president yesterday just fired the guy in charge of the war effort. But in the wake of the General McChrystal firing, the relationship between our country's civilian and military leadership is a white-hot issue for a reason. On the specifics, today, as this massive privately funded medical health, uh, excuse me, mental health treatment center opened, the Pentagon's top general in charge of that issue resigned amid continuing reports that Pentagon efforts to get better at treating TBI, treating post-traumatic stress, just aren't succeeding well enough or fast enough. On the political side, as the White House revels in the compliments on how strong the president looks for taking command and firing a rogue general, the fact remains that General Stanley McChrystal was very popular among rank-and-file troops. On the war effort more broadly, even as liberals like me lament the escalation of the war and the counterinsurgency doctrine that seems to call for a never-ending escalation, the leader of the nation's largest group of Iraq and Afghanistan vets, someone for whom I have enormous respect, Paul Rykoff, took to our airwaves on this show last night to express bitter frustration that veterans of these current wars don't feel like they have anyone to turn to in this White House for support on their issues. There's no magic way to knit together the military and civilian leadership in a republic like ours. There's not going to be a President Petraeus. None of the last three presidents, Democrat or Republican, served in a war. There's going to be resentment and name-calling and alienation and grumbling, sometimes even accidentally to reporters over Bud Light Lime in Paris. But as we continue to fight two wars, and as the nation finds its attention wrenched back to the Afghan war again now, there are ways for civilian political leadership to convince both the military and the country that we are all pulling in the same direction. 
I don't believe it's about just showing up to the right ribbon cuttings. I'm, I'm not an optics person, and neither are you, if the memory of George W. Bush in that flight suit, flight suit still makes you throw up a little bit in your mouth. Uh, it's not about optics. It's not about style. It is about substance. The Veterans Affairs Department needs more than just more money, which it has gotten. It needs a tremendous kick in the tail, like the Minerals Management Service has gotten, to make the benefits process less of a Kafka-esque hell for our veterans. The departure of the general in charge of dealing with TBI and post-traumatic stress necessitates an even higher profile, more powerful replacement for her. The White House needs to know that young veterans of America's current wars feel out of the loop, and they need a high-placed ally with some pull. And politically on the war effort, if we really are supposed to believe that this unity of effort, it's not just a military thing, counterinsurgency doctrine, uh, if we're really supposed to believe in that, then we're probably due to hear that post McChrystal, the leaders on the civilian side, Carl Eikenberry, Richard Holbrook, even Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, are also having their feet held to the fire on what we're doing in Afghanistan. That they also know their jobs are on the line if they look out for themselves and their own fiefdoms more than the mission. There is no magic way to close the inevitable and probably healthy gap between military and civilian leadership. But we need to remember what this is all about. Our nation is at war. Our nation is at war, and there is work that still needs to be done to remind us that really it is our nation at war and not just our military on their own.